morning and welcome to our live talk program. This is Lauren Gerb here, your host on Revive Reform Radio, doing our live talk program covering the importance of church on this year, Tuesday morning, Rise and Shine. And this morning, my topic here is the conflict that arises when church and state mix. The conflicts that arises when church and state mix. So this is our process of discussion. I have some articles I want to share with you this morning here. So welcome, hopefully, to the Blessed Light Rest, and you're ready to take on this day that the Lord has given you. Let us pray. Our Father, what in heaven, we thank you again for the blessings of your word. We thank you for the understanding that you've given to us and the um, way that you have us to conduct ourselves. I pray to the Lord that truly that we might always... Um, be charitable to all men, um, no matter who they are, and especially those of the household of faith. May you bless us, we pray, as we look into these things that are happening around us. For Christ's sake, amen. So again, our topic for this morning here is the conflict that arises when church and state mix. The conflicts that arises when church and state mix. And um, this is just sad reality of how things go when church and state mix and um, I start off here by reading a passage of scripture to you and um, and I stick in here from Matthew chapter 22 verse 15 Matthew chapter 22 verse 15 through 21 and it says then went the Pharisees into counsel how they might entangle him in his talk which is entangle Christ in his preaching and uh, my point is out that it was not for the charitable deeds, the non-profit work that Christ was doing. It's the healing, the sick, and the feeding the poor. Um, but it's for what he was teaching. They didn't like that. And verse 16 says, And they sent out, out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for, for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived in their wickedness, and said, Why tempt it? Why tempt ye me? Ye hypocrites, show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he said unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. And so this is the principle that Christ teach, where um, the things that are God's render to God, and the things that are Caesar render unto Caesar. Uh, but when the process of story mixing and mingling, uh, churchcraft and statecraft, things start to become dicey, and, and things start to become in problematic um, in the sense that uh, like for instance when you take tax from one religious group to Caesar Caesar use it for certain taxes and you know to run the government run the, the infrastructure take care of the infrastructure all that um, when it started becoming diocese when now some of that money start to be used to benefit or give power to another group then that started to becoming a problem because it's almost like I'm you're taking money from one group to fund another group so they can be more successful. And so Christ says, you know, I've been just leave the church stuff, the church stuff. <laughs> and that's how it's always best. And leave the state stuff, the state stuff. And things are good. And humanity always struggle with that because we like to pick winners. So we want to know that our group is going to win and those are on our side is going to win. And a lot of what we see going on in the world is really aligned with that concept. Whose side is winning? Whose side is losing? So I have two articles to share on that thought, um, which is my main um, thought for this morning here, the conflicts that arise when church and state mix. Um, but before I go into those two articles, I have a, a, a kind of a, a religious piece, but more of kind of a interesting, fluff and crazy at the same time piece that I want to share with you. And then I go into my main two articles um, here for this morning and talking about, you know, the idea of religion. So this is about religion. And this is taken again from Christian Post, written by Stoyan Zamov. And it's entitled, Christians, Exorcists, Pro Protest, Evil, New York, um, Witches, 
hex of um, hex of Trump Kavanaugh. All right, so all of that will be explained in a second. Uh, dozens of dozens of Christian pr protested Saturday's public hex of Donald Trump and Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh in New York, with Catholic exorcist condemning the witches. Um, so hex, which is spell H E X, right? So H E X. Um, is or sometimes they say hexes which is h-e-x-e-e-s uh, which is similar to like putting a curse on somebody or a spell uh, it is just doing a, a seance so to speak against someone anyhow so we keep going only about 60 people over the um of over 1300 that planned to planned to attend showed up at the public hexing in the New York Post, um, in, uh, that was reported in the New York Post, while um, a dozen Christians protested outside the Brooklyn witch shop um, where the event took place. We are praying against their hexes, one believer said. Catlin um, Books, which organized the hexing, live, live streamed the event online, describing it as an act of resistance and resilience. Uh, Dakota um, Brackhale, uh, co-owner of the Catlin Books, uh, told told BBC News that the goal of the X, which include candles and photo representation of Trump, Kavanaugh, and GOP Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, is aimed at ex um, exposing Brett Kavanaugh for what he truly is, to cause him harm and see him undone. The organizers added that they expected to see results from the X as soon as possible. They're not a firm timeline on these things, they said. Kavanaugh was accused by California professor Christian Ford, Christine Ford of attempted rape in the 1980s. Other women have also accused him of other forms of sexual misconduct. He has denied all the accusations. Trump, um, along with the majority of Republican senators, decided to stand by Kavanaugh and successfully see him confirm to the Supreme Court. Um, Brackhale said that Catlin Books has experienced a pretty severe amount of backlash in, a f in the form of hate mail death threats um, due to the ritual. Um, Brackhale uh, insisted that previous hexes placed on Trump has proven to be successful. However, stating, we feel the rituals were a success as they sought to expose Trump for what it is, and that has happened on many levels, um, from the Russian probe to the expose on his fiance, fiances to Stormy Daniel, the porn actress who says, she had a sexual affair with Trump in 2016. Defending the rituals, she argued that witchcraft has always been practiced by the most downtrodden, disenfranchised, and oppressed people who have used it as a tool for survival to be, ar to be the arbiter of their own justice since it, wouldn't, it would be denied by the powers that be. Father Garrett Thomas a Roman Catholic exorcist for the Diocese of San Jose, California, said in an article for the National Catholic, Catholic Register that priests have offered prayers for Kavanaugh in response to the X, warning that witches, witchcraft is a serious threat. I'm appalled, Thomas um, said about the X. I sent this to a, um, to a load of exorcists yesterday and their reaction was similar to mine. That shows this is not something that is make-believe, he added. Um, the exorcist said that he has seen people in the satanic world growing bolder in the past decade or so. They are more confident that the general public will be more accepting of the demonic, he said. This is, this is a conjuring of evil. Not about free speech, Thomas continued. Conjuring a personified evil does not fall under free speech. 
Satanic cults often commit crimes. They murder, sexually abuse everyone in, in their cult. Isn't that fascinating? I will read it again later. The exorcists um, argue that curses placed on people in a state of grace do not have much effect, though it in other cases he has seen people afflicted with physical illness, psychosis, depression, and what he said was demons attack to them. The decision to do this against the Supreme Court justice is an heinous act and say a lot about the character of the people that should not be underestimated and dismissed. The priest said, this, these are real evil people, end of quote. So this wanted to read that piece, I guess, um, for what I do here, this is probably kind of a fluff piece, but I, I found it uh, fascinating. So the which which is uh i guess it's probably about 60 people assembled i don't know if all of them were witches uh but uh, they they claim that over a thousand something people would have turned up but i guess they didn't uh, so the witches were putting x's on kavanaugh and trump and then now the exorcist was praying um i guess to keep trump and kavanaugh in a state of grace so they're not affected by the evil because if they are affected by the evil they could have experienced physical illness psychosis depression and what he said was demons attacked to them right so they're praying for that so the exorcists and the and the witches are going at it fighting power for power uh interesting enough though when i read this even earlier uh at this thing here about satan and cults often commit crimes or right? keep that in mind crimes they murder and sexually abuse everyone in their cult so I, I just want you to think about that this is the priest the catholic priest who claims to be an exorcist say that satan and cult often commit crimes they murder and sexually abuse everyone in their cult everyone gets abused in the satanic cult that's what the catholic exorcists say uh, that's interesting in light of the news that comes out about the Catholic Church and their being, um, we call it, investigated for sexual crimes on minors all across the United States. Uh, so it's fascinating stuff there. So anyhow, so that's just a fluff piece. Um, not a fluff piece, a serious piece, but uh, not you, you know, it's fluffy to me because both groups are arguing against each other and and blaming crimes that both groups are well known for doing both of them uh, abuse sexually abuse each each other so we go to this article here now so this is now back to my main topic um just wanted to put that piece out there to you and my main topic here is um the conflict that arises when church and state mix so i have two articles about what's going on outside of the United States. So the first one is what's going on in Iraq. And um and how some of what I see here, looking back how things are arranged a certain way and why things are arranged a certain way. So this again is taken from Christian Post here and um it's entitled Iraq Christians rebuild homeland with help from Trump administration, Knight of Columbus. Uh, so both Knight of Columbus and Knight of Colum Knights of Columbus and the Trump administration is working together to help rebuild Christian homelands for the Iraqi Christians. And it's written by Samuel Smith over the Christian Post. The United States government has agreed to a partnership with a leading Catholic humanitarian group that aim, aims to help the administration facilitate much-needed aid and assistance to help persecuted religious minorities in the Middle East. The U.S. Agency for um, International Development um, has agreed to a memorandum of understanding 
with the nation's leading Catholic fraternity organization, Knights of Columbus. The goal of the agreement is to facilitate partnership to help communities in the Middle East recover from genocide and persecution, the connect and connect the agency with local faith and community leaders to help deliver aid rapidly to persecuted Christian communities. Under the agreement, the Knights will help USAID by sharing information and identifying projects and potential recipients of AIDS. The Knights of Columbus has have been one of the most active US-based groups on the ground supporting a recovery effort for the beleaguered Christian community in the Nineveh Plains which was decimated when ISIS gained control from 2014 to 2017. The Knights have already committed $20 million to recovery and humanitarian effort in Iraq since 2014. The agreement comes as U.S. government continues to face criticism amid claims that the U.S. Have, hasn't provided aid to Iraq's Christian community. Even though over $200 million has been designated by the U.S. AID for planned and active assistance to support the recovery in northern Iraq, the head of Iraq, Chaldean Catholic Church, Claim recently that the U.S. has done anything to help Christians in the Middle East. USAID responded by pushing back against any notion that the agency has provided aid to religious minorities in Iraq. In a press release, USAID acknowledged that it could use the help of Knights of Columbus because their deep experience promoted interfaith dialogue. Um, provides them with a reach and a voice in communities that often exceed our own. Uh, the importance of a trusted voice when assisting survivors of genocide cannot be overstated, U.S. AID statement reads, the memorandum of understanding will allow U.S. AID and the Knights of Columbus to leverage U.S. government funding against the contributions of the American philanthropists, philanthropists in the coordinated response to the genocide and persecution. USAID and the Knights of Columbus will work together to identify populations in need and assist them, convene local actors, advance pluralism, collaborate on efforts to prevent future atrocities. On Tuesday, USAID announced that it has doubled its total assistance to support persecuted ethnics, ethnic and religious minorities in Iraq since July to over $239 million. Since Vice President Mike Pence announced the creation of the Genocide Recovery and Persecution Response Initiative in July, USAID has expanded the number of part partners it's working with to help persecuted minority communities in Iraq. USAID is now working with 36 local, 11 faith-based, and 27 um, international organizations in Iraq. So out of the 36 left or faith-based, 27 are international organizations. But the measure of the progress is not in dollar amount. It is in the lives and communities we have helped to revive and restored and in a concrete progress on the ground in Iraq, uh, Iraq's Nineveh Plain, USAID Administrator Mark Green said in a statement. One example is in the town of uh, Bahiqua, uh, where USAID's um, assistance has repaired war-damaged houses and provided essential household goods to enable families to return. Additionally, Green said USAID um, has funded the rehabilitation of wells that provided clean, clear water to over 1,200 residents. The agency has helped repair transformers and other electric utility structures, finance mobile uh, medical units, and help improve safety around schools and under public care. 
USAID is helping families build a future in Bashika uh, by providing 21 schools in the town with the equipment necessary for students to continue their um, education, Green said. We are also helping residents heal by funding events to commemorate the suffering of the Yazidi, Yazidi uh, community and by supporting dialogue among people of different faiths. Through our new partnership and increased resources, USAID will continue to support those who are working to create an Iraq that is peaceful, diverse, and prosperous. Responding to the criticism of the U.S. government response to the Iraq Knight of Columbus spokesperson, Joe Cullen, said that the key is to look at how challenges have been addressed. In this case, it is clear that USAID has taken has taken provided support to communities targeted for genocide by ISIS very seriously. Cullen said in a statement shared by the Christian Post, it has dispatched a highly qualified special representative to the region to facilitate assisting these communities and to make sure the work done with U.S. money is done well. It has provided funding and equipment for a number of projects directly to affect affected communities and has also provided massive amount of money for the rebuilding of infrastructure in the event province. And it close off by saying here that those projects include provision of psycho, uh, psychosocial services for the SZD and so forth. And it says they explain that three projects are code designed by the Knights of, Knights of the USAID and cost several hundred thousand dollars. And um, just I'll stop there. Just a few more information there. So this is the um, type of projects that's going on. And um, this this is the type of um, things that happen. So what is it, as you know, there, there's been a bigger push, I would say, especially since the President George Bush administration. I remember when he came into office, the first thing he started talking about was he wanted to do a faith-based initiative because he says the connection of the church is already well established in the community and these faith-based initiative is what we need to move forward. And basically what it is is putting the taxpayer dollar to work by turning the money over to churches and the churches basically use that dollar to do those faith-based initiatives. So the initiative is, is like a church says, this is what we want to do. And this is the initiative we want to pursue. And instead of the church going to its donors, and they fund it, the church go to the state, and the state tax dollar funded. But as the state tax dollar is funded, as you know, why Washington is in so much fights, is that money's power. Because you can give projects and jobs to people that's power the people you're serving the people you're employing that's where the power is and if you're controlling a percentage even if it's a small percentage of the american federal tax base you're cutting your power and you can't wield that power the way you want to and also use that power to build your your um empire your um ministry because the money is coming in large amount. Because as I say, that's a big war chest there. If they say true philanthropic organizations or donors, the Knight of Columbus have drawn up $20 million. But the big part is 200 or something, $239 million. Um, you know, you do a dollar for dollar match or you do a one for five match. You know, you'll be a one to a little bit over 12, about 1 to 12 match. That's a good match, you know, for every 1 to 13, sorry. For every dollar you put up, they'll put up 13. 
uh, that could cause an acceleration in the growth and power of your organization without your donors, but with the taxpayer's dollar. So why this type of stuff is fascinating to me, because as we know, um, more and more, each presidential, each president that comes around, the line between the state and the church is becoming more murky. And the tax dollars that are used by this church to fund fund their projects, their initiative, which again, it will put them into a power seat because that's a place of power. Because you look at, at and I take this project here as an example or this situation here. So for all of us that have been following the, the news with the war in Iraq, uh, that war, although the ISIS came to massive power in 2014, and one of the groups that were affected severely by the ISIS was the Yazidi. But other than that, other Christian groups that are Catholic link and other Orthodox church linked were affected severely. They were end up after fighting against ISIS in Iraq and in Syria. So th their communities and so forth are in tatters. They're, they're being whipped. And they say it's a genocide. But first, before we talk about a genocide, we first have to talk about what caused that what was the result of that and it was a result of a war in iraq initiated by, by president Donald, to a president <laughs> that's funny president george bush so he started that war and he created a, a situation a vacuum no leadership or so forth because they decided they were not only going to overthrow the iraqi government they had no plans of how to stabilize and run the country it was a, we're just going to get rid of this guy because he's a boogeyman he's a devil and you know how it goes already it is well that was a popular movement you had a devil and this is a westernized thinking you have a devil you need to get rid of the devil and so they got rid of the devil but they never have a plan to replace that devil so now in comes a constant factional war between the the um the Sunni and the Shia. But here goes another problem with all that because in order for you to go in and not institute democracy, but you choose who is gonna be in leadership, is you're choosing a religious side. So that's the first, if you say bullet point here. Remember the conflicts that arise when church and state mix. Because automatic, that war, without even most people knowledge, they were going to have to choose a new leadership. The Sunni was in power. And they're going to get rid of the Sunni leader, but they were not going to just get rid of the Sunni leader because the Sunni leader had put basically mainly his people in charge of the country. This was something of the British colonial system. This is how they do the pit Hutu against Tutsi and so forth. This is how they do it. They keep one group to you know, tamp down rebellion by being, you know, preferential to one group so the other group can keep the other group down. So one group oppress the other group and then they give the money to the, the colonizers. Well, that was a system that was in, in Iraq, Sunni control, but the Sunni is one faction of a religious group. So America not only had to remove the Sunni leader, you, they will have to put in Shia leader. But the Shia leader, this will cause a factional fighting. The fight is going to break up because the Sunni is going to fight back. Well, that's what you had. Then come the more radical group, 2014, or somewhere around there. They were there before, but they became powerful. ISIS. And they came in with a more draconian, crazy um, form of Muslim. And they start to fight for what was reported at least. And that created now another, you know, like, you, you know, the Bible talks about where you, you know, you open up the, the bottomless pit and all these locusts and demons and everything coming out of the pit. Well, that's what they did. They opened it up and then out of that Pandora box come a whole lot of crazies. And they started to just swat each other. And they're still over there killing each other because by taking away the leader, 
that was holding everybody in check. The strong man you created now, somebody like nobody can hold the money check. That's they did it in Libya and you know they're still over there swatting each other like flying. So this is what happened. So when you look at this idea here now, you see where you create this this issue happened where now you have to not just do a war, you have to choose who's next. And now you say the Shia is next, but the Shia is linked to Iraq. So that's become difficult. Uh, not Iraq, but Iran. So that's become difficult. And if my memory serves me clear, the Sunni is linked to um, Saudi Arabia. So although you're fighting for global dominance and all that, you have this constant mix of religion in the mix that muddies the waters of murky waters of conquest. And now you have this thing now where you're going to turn over money now to another religious group which is given power because these groups, they're not just in there as um, just your normal NGOs, non-governmental organization. They ultimately pledge to the Pope, the Pope in Vatican. And you're empowering their institution and you're also giving them the monies that they're going to have to distribute to other groups. So that's power because the, the, you're, you're basically secondarily. Let, let me say it this way because it just make you know I'm thinking. Um, my, my brain is awake this morning. Not probably primarily choosing a religion, but it's, this is the type of stuff you do where you're on the road to start making decisions for one religious group over the other. I'm going to go back now and point out one or two things in this article. Just to show you what I'm saying. Notice in the press release, the USAID acknowledged that it could use the help of the Knights of Columbus because, quote, their deep experience in promoting interfaith dialogue. So notice here, the whole even to give aid is not a neutral thing. It has to be done in an interfaith dialogue. I thought we just give our food and building wells, right? And provide them with a reach and a voice in, in communities that often exceed our own. So then you find that it's not just, okay, we're going to go in here. We're just dealing with infrastructure, schools, you know, roads wild water, sanitary disposal, just the regular things that community. Now we're talking about we need to get in there and get into interfaith stuff because many times when these aids are being given out, they're given out on contingencies and they give it out to certain groups because you can't make certain groups or they don't want certain groups get power. So who makes that decision? Uh, is it just about water and food or is it more that's going on? Or often what you find is more going on because if you're going, I say there's a fight between communism and democracy in a country and America said we are on the Democrat side and the USAID comes in and say we want to give out some money for schools and stuff like that. Who are you going to make control? Are you going to make the communist control distribution or the or the Democrats, you're going to say, you know, people are Democratic. You're going to say, no, we're going to give it to the Democrats. Well, the same thing can happen here. If you, if uh, after the war is over, you're going in. You want somebody that has the reach of the community to say, who gets the money? And most naturally, they're going to say, none of the Sunni people gets the money. Or none of the Shia people get the money. But by doing that, it's like you're preferencing, again, one religious group over the other. Now you have religion, it's not just politics now, as in a Democrat and socialist or communist situation scenario. Now you're choosing which religious group. The religious group that gets ostracized, now they have to seek other places for their funding. And, you know, on and on we go. Where do we stop? No one knows. Well, the Bible knows. So the uh, so the, this is where it says, now the importance of a trusted voice when assisting survivors of genocide cannot be overstated. So, let me ask you this. Um, do you know that the Knights of Columbus, you personally listen to me here this morning, do you know that the Knights of Columbus are a trusted group? 
do you know what the Knights of Columbus is? Do you have you do you this is your opinion of them? Um you know of them as a trusted group. I make I'm not gonna make you think about it. Think about it after I finish reading. I'm gonna keep going. But I want you to think about that. Because this is a trusted group that has deep connection and interfaith dialogue. Have you heard of them known as a group that has deep connection and interfaith dialogue? If you hear a group called Knights of Columbus, forget about any Wikipedia reading. Just the name of the group. They're a group that pledge allegiance, as I say. They're one of the front organization for the Catholic Church. And just the name. Uh, the name, the last name is Columbus. They're the knights. Now, what are knights? You know, knights are, you know, the main guys that are anointed by the queen or the king to go and fight their wars for them and to lead our war efforts and stuff for them. They protect the kingdom. Who is Columbus? Columbus is the guy that went and discovered to take new lands over for the queen of Spain and for Europe. And these guys are the knights of Columbus. They go into new territories and take over. So when did the Knights of Columbus be this group that millions and millions of US dollars need to be spent through them to help beleaguered, beaten up, genocidal people who are desperate and in need and not need to see these guys riding in on a white horse coming to give them well and water. Who are you giving power to? The American government? Are you disrepresenting the American people? Or disrepresent the Catholic Church? Um, so this is a coordinated effort that is going to notice here, work together to identify population in need and assist them. What do you mean identify population? Everybody over there is all messed up. That's why they're fleeing to Europe. So what what, what is need to be identify population in need and assist them and convene local actors, right? Um, who's doing that? So Knight of Columbus is picking who's doing that. The, these are the Knights. And advance pluralism. Advance pl what is pluralism? Pluralism is that it's this um it's an ideological concept. You know, what you believe. And then you come over, you come over here. Listener number two, you tell me what you believe. Listener number five, you tell me what you believe. And then we all work together so that we all believe the same thing. There's some type of Tower of Babel stuff. And collaborate and on efforts to prevent future atrocities. So we need to work together so that we. Do you know what this is? This is this is just nigh madness. This is so the American taxpayer dollars is working to advance pluralism. Not so that means American tax dollars is going to be used through the Knight of Columbus to advance pluralism i just want to repeat that to you this is the statement coming out of the u.s i'm reading the usaid statement this is not the knights of columbus statement um i'm reading as i say usd and knight of columbus will work together to identify population in need uh, and assist them convene local actors advance pluralism so this is uh, this is what you call propaganda and indoctrination um, of people who they're helping the people who were just experienced genocide. So after you genocide them, you bring them back, and you get the local actors. You advance pluralism um, and collaborate on effort to prevent future atrocity. Who you're collaborating with? Uh, you, you, I want you to think about who you, you mean. The fighters that have re-engage in the are reintegrated into the society. You're going to indoctrinate them so they don't um, take up war guns anymore and start killing each other. So this is what happening. So notice here, these are all this type of stuff we have to do. So um, did you know that the Knights of Columbus do this job? They, they go around and advance pluralism and um, prevent future atrocity. Remember, who started this atrocity? It's important for you to answer the question, who attacked who? Who which was the current first person in the country that invaded um under the pretext of weapons of mass destruction? And where did this end up? What started this factional fighting? And who chose the instead of choosing a neutral arbiter or a vote, I mean let the people vote and vote in their representative just like it is in America. Just imagine if a foreign government invaded America 
and choose the the, the Democrats. No, no, better yet, imagine if the a foreign government attack America under the pretext of weapons of mass destruction and choose the Green Party to be the de facto leader of the country and both the Republicans and Democrats thinking you choose the Green Party and then the Green Party now is going to run America green. <laughs> that would be fascinating. And then now you have the Democrats and the Republicans who have the big guns decided that no, we're going to fight. And then after the fight and, uh, and the dust settle and all of the dead bodies laying all around, they come around and they say, well, let's use this, you know, European AID to, um, with the, the, the Knights of Columbus to facilitate, um, let's read it down, to assist um, in the identifying, to identify populations in need of assistance, everybody. <laughs> Um, convene local actors. That means they choose who they want and you have to comply. Advance pluralism. Uh, America was pluralistic <laughs> before that and collaborate in the effort to prevent future atrocities. Uh, this sounds fascinating. So this is what it is. So this is why I really believe in what the Bible teaches, what Christ teaches, um, that let the powers that are supposed to be take care of the things that has to do with um, governance and um, just your civil activity and then let indoctrination and teachings be the norm of the Christian society or believers, Muslim, you know, the witches over there who are doing hexes, whatever they want to believe, let them do that. But the government, no need to choose that because again, if there's a whole bunch of covens would Knights of Columbus choose them, you know, this is where it is. So you start choosing who live and who die. The Bible is very clear that this is not the way to go. And this creates more problems because more, you see now, this is why now do trouble will arise. Just mark my word. Because when they start doing this, then some people are going to get left out. They're going to say, like, no, you can't get none of this money because you have to accept our plurality. Uh, so we go to my third article I'm going to share with you here. And this is entitled, and remember my topic here is the conflicts that arises when church and state mix. Because again, picking who wins or who lose, even a business situation is a wrong thing, much less in religion. So Trump administration, this is um, again an article from Christian Post here. It says Trump administration backs creation of new Ukrainian Orthodox Church. So and this is written by Michael uh, Grabowski. And it's continue here. It says the Trump administration ex expressed its support for the recent decision by the Orthodox Church to create an independent church in the Ukraine despite opposition from the Russian Church. The Patriarch of Constantinople seen as first among equals in the Orthodox Church leadership, recently agreed to the creation of an independent church in Ukraine in response to the request of many in the Eastern European nation who took issue with the Russian Orthodox Church. Secretary of State Michael Pompeo released a statement last Friday expressing support for the newly created Ukrainian Orthodox Church reiterating the administration's strong support for the religious freedom and freedom of members of religious group, including Ukrainian Orthodox community, to govern their, religious, uh, um, their religion according to their beliefs, free of outside interference. We support Ukrainians' ability to worship as they choose and hope this will be respected by all, by all, Tolerance, restraint, and understanding are key to ensuring that people with different religious affiliations can live and prosper together in peace, Pump stated Pompeo. We urge church and government officials to actively promote these values in connection with the move toward an establishment of the Autocephalous Ukrainian Orthodox Church. 
Calls within Ukraine for an independent Orthodox Church came largely in response to the 2014 annexation of Ukraine's Crimea province by Russia. Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko was among those who have supported the decision to create an independent church, saying in a statement quoted by the BBC that it is an issue of Ukrainian national security and an issue of Ukrainian statehood. In response to the constant uh, to Constantinople's decision, Russian Orthodox Church officials announced that they were cutting ties with the Central Orthodox church community in a move considered by some to be the worst schism the church has faced in several century centuries uh, metropolitan larian the moscow um, patriarchate head of the external relations blame pa um, patriarch bartholomew of the first of constantinople on the main church leader of the Orthodox Church in a statement earlier this month. We now stand before a new church reality. We no longer have a single coordinated center in the Orthodox Church. We must we must um we must very clearly recognize that, says Larion, according to the ABC News. Constantinople Patriarchate liquidated itself as such a center end of quote there all right so uh, this this article here is big in one way to do with my topic and it's bigger in something else that I, I probably won't i'll mention here right now and then i'll go back to my thing uh probably a little bit over a year i've been following that war i've watched some of the videos on that war in ukraine and what was going on even russia at one point, just a lot of hours and hours and hours and hours, hours of videos because I was fascinated by what was going on there. Because, as you know, that war affected religion because the Russian Orthodox Church, um, which is part of the Orthodox Church in Constantinople, you know, there was a split and some of the power stays that the Catholic Church broke off, I think. I think it's 1024 or 10 something. I, I can't remember what it is. So anyhow, it's, it's been over a thousand years. So anyhow, so there's a split. And so there's the Western and the Eastern. The Eastern is in Constantinople. It, so Yeah, the Eastern is in Constantinople. And it takes over places like Russia and so forth. And then the Catholic Church in Rome, it does the Western European Empire. So the White West, the East West, the White East and the West. All right, so you have these two churches, and now what it is is that say um, this fight in in um, Ukraine um, had put a strain on the church. If you were following that, and many people believe that what was the Russians believe, to be clear, the Russians believe that America it was behind all of that, and so they they started to see anything West as being. Uh, like spies. All right. So why this is important now? Because this now is a split in the church. Now, if you remember a little bit over a year ago, sometime about spring, summer last year, there were brethren in Adventism who, who study and preach prophecy. Uh, they were saying that the church, the Catholic church, um, by summer, if, if any of you follow this, well, they were saying the Catholic Church by summer this year is the schism in the Catholic Church going to heal, and both the East and the Western is going to come together, and that's going to issue issue in uh, tyranny, uh, um, and and we gonna, I guess we're going to move to the end of the world. This is what the brethren were preaching. And I remember them preaching it and I was thinking, uh, I'm not sure if they're following what's going on. Because wh wh while that might be something that they were discussing, that they were going to heal a schism, I think this month they were saying, if I'm not correct, if I'm not mistaken, I think they were saying in the summer or in by now. Because I think we just yesterday was October 22nd, 18, um, 2018. 
which 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 is a commemoration of the Day of Atonement. So they were saying that, and, and, and as I said, this is a side issue because I want to finish up my thought on this article. Um, so imagine uh, at the same, when they're saying, uh, remember, they were predicting that there's going to be the total reunification of the schism that came about a thousand years. At the same time, um, there's going to be a, there's a lot of fraction, fractioning of the the Catholic Church. So now you have it where, say, a thousand, I think, 24, you go check my date, a thousand whatever years ago, the Catholic Church had fractured. Then now, it, it's basically not a reunification of the whole thing, but a fractured again. And this time, they're saying the Ukrainian Church need to run its own business, right? And, and so instead of, I don't know if you get what happened there, instead of, what they were saying is going to happen it actually is the continued fracturing. Oh, let's get back to this article. Let's see if we can wrap up the thought. Because uh, there's two thoughts here. So one thought is first, if you follow that war now, if you remember if you follow the war, and you go back and watch some of the, the interviews, videos, read articles on that war, um, the ambassador, similar to what happened in Syria, the ambassador for the United States, and various different actors in America were promoting and encouraging the removal of the puppet government in Ukraine, according to what I was reading, um, allegedly. The puppet government in Ukraine that was there to basically suck the, the money out for Russia. The guy basically was just living, lav you know, the regular thing, living lavishly and basically allowed the people to suffer. And so the Ukrainian, now the opposition, decided that not only we need to break from the sky, but we need to align the government and the infrastructure and everything to now suck the money for the West because they need to take all the investments and the money and put it in the West, Western banks. And that was basically part of the schism. But, you know, normally in those countries, the church and the government are not necessarily separated. So it put the church in a situation because what's going to happen? As you know, those churches and those pastors, they don't separate church and politics. So if you have a state that is separated and west, but the church is east, eastern orthodox, and you know, so forth, then what will happen is that sooner or later the pastors will overthrow the state and bring it back east, back to Russia. So what happened, I guess, over the course now of more recently, they decided they need to have an independent church, independent of the Russian Orthodox Church, which now the Russian Orthodox, is set off a fight because the Russian Orthodox say, according to what I just read, that we will not look to um, Constantinople as the coordinated center for the Orthodox Church. Um, uh, we must very clearly recognize that. And that Constantinople Patriarchate liquidated itself as such a center. So this is a split. And it's a split because why? Uh, America wanted the money and everything from the real Ukrainian system denominated over by America. And some of it got even de denominated, but Russia decided to annex C Crimea because its military bases and stuff and ports are there. So this is what happened. And this is the history of what happened. So if you notice, I think when even back to what I was saying earlier, a little bit earlier, that when they made those statements um, about what's going to happen, uh, I don't even think they were watching what was going on, period. And so um, this is what happened. So you can understand why Russia worked so hard to affect the American election because America was affected its power base. You, you see what's going on? It's, it's like... They hit Russia by hitting Ukraine. And Russia said, we're going to hit you back. And it's war going on, but it's a cyber war. It's an influence war. And it's a proxy war. America and Russia have been fighting that war for a long, long time. And they're still fighting it. Now they're fighting the religion. But here's the thing now. Notice here, when you, again, this is a second era where war was going on. War is being fought in Syria, Iraq. But these wars... Um, because these countries are 
religious base in the sense that their state and church don't their church and state does not separate when you go into a war you have to be able to make a choice religiously and since some people in the country was for russia and some people what was for the west they had to make a decision the only thing that is it was interested in is still interested in ukraine that minority christian groups are often persecuted because they're seen as connected to western churches especially american churches and they are suspicious especially even russia of any western churches this is why again they went after the jehovah's witness because they're suspicious because jehovah's witness is headquarters up here in new york so they're suspicious so any group that could be seen to american leading russians are afraid of because they're fighting a war with a cold war a cyber war a war of influence a war of money with america notice in syria the russians are back in um al bashar assad the president the prime minister or president or whatever you call him of syria america is back in the rebel forces and, and i think it's in saudi arabia to try to attack and get rid of him so russia has financial ties so notice although the religious element is there um the main element is money is power is is oil but in order for you to fight a war in those areas religion become mixed mixed up in there and then you have to choose a side but then now the side you choose it easily turn from a war for oil and resources to a, a religious war and now because of that you're gonna have to now choose as i can say this really quickly because of the sake of time now the they have to be a statement now last week friday that came now from michael pompeo which is the secretary of state saying he expressed support for the newly created he support he expressed support not express neutrality but support um for the newly created ukrainian orthodox but this church is a process of basically switching the money so now you have to support a religious move that is a fractional religious move wrong or right but this is the type of thing that you have to do and so now that church will be viewed as a creation resulting from american move and then you have a statement like this from michael pompeo it seemed like now they can use this and say well oh yeah see that's the american is supporting this the americans are behind this and if you watch videos on it you can hear basically people both in ukraine and in russia saying this is really an american move so they have a retired administration strong support for the religious freedom and freedom of members of religious group including ukraine orthodox community to govern their religion according to their belief uh, and free from outside interference but if you watched it you realize really quickly it was outside interference it was basically a war to split the country and so forces so says support ukrainian ability to worship as they choose and hope this um this will be respected by all tolerance restraint and understanding are key to ensure people with different religious affiliation can live and prosper together but you know this was not a war about religious um tolerance. there was no question about religious um affiliation and all that all that was put to the test because of the war and so if you look at it in many of these places are the same the religion and the state so tied together that you have to choose sides and you have to create these things and this is what end up happening here and i saw it coming because as i say you could you as i say you go online you have time go watch you see there is like a disdain because it it it's the the people connected america and the church and all that it, there's like no separation in their minds they see it like as one and the same and so us you do you want to go this way you you with us over here russia you want to go this way so multiple wars and these things constantly come up and um there's a lot more i have to say but i know i was going to run out of time so let us pray our father watch devil we thank you again for the blessings of your word we thank you dear lord for the guidance that we give unto caesar what is caesar 
and to D we give to D and we try not to blend any of those things to create more confusion and problems. May you bless us, dear Lord, as we go through the rest of this day. And may you truly um, continue to guide us that we might appreciate more, not only your word, but just this clear teaching of the separation of church and state. Be with us, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Thanks for being with me here on the Revive for Media. Looking forward to talking to you again tomorrow morning where we should talk about natural health. Until then, I pray that you may continue to walk with the King. Mm -hmm.